All right, we're going to present today Solomon as the epitome, the best human king that could ever come, and yet he's the biggest failure. Are you ready? This is going to be a good one. You guys are going to like it this morning. Deuteronomy 8, 11, and 12. Now, remember, this is like 400. How long have we been a nation? A couple hundred years. This was written 400 years before Solomon. They under, they, then they already went through two kings. They went through Saul and David. And let's look what it says. God says, beware that you forget not the Lord your God and not keeping his commandments and his judgments and his statutes, which I command you this day, lest when you've eaten and are full and you have built goodly houses and dwelt there. Okay, now look at the screen here, the PowerPoints. Okay, they built goodly houses. Now I'm going to keep reading, but you can kind of watch the screen or watch the screen and follow along. And then in Deuteronomy 13, it says, and when your herds and your flocks multiply, okay? Now, of course, you have all these herds and flocks. You're going to need some help. <laughs> but when all of those things multiply, and then it says, and your silver and your gold and all that you have is multiplied, and then your heart be lifted it up and you forget the Lord your God which brought you forth out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. This is why they pray after the meals, not before the meals. Because the problem is when we're totally full and blessed, that's when we forget God. No one comes to God in the good times. They only come to God in the bad times. So he says, when you're totally blessed, the big problem is if you forget me. So now let's watch what happens to Solomon. He wrote this in Ecclesiastes 2, 4 through 9, and you can watch the screen as well. He says, I made, how do you know if someone's into themselves? I, me, my, mine. Let's listen to what he wrote. He says, I built me houses and I planted me vineyards and I made me gardens and orchards. I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. And then he says, and I made me pools of water, okay, to water wherewith the wood that brings forth trees. And I got me servants, and I got me maidens, and I had servants born in my house. Also, I had great possessions of great and small cattle and the peculiar treasures of kings and provinces. And I got me, I got me silver and gold, and, and, and I got me men singers and women singers, okay, and delights of the sons of men as musical instruments and that of all sorts. So I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also, my wisdom remained with me with all of these great things. Now, does that sound like Deuteronomy? Does that, <laughs> Solomon's totally blessed. He's given wisdom, fame, fortune, power, authority, and uh, he forgot God. This is the problem with riches. And then look at, now how many of you know Solomon built the temple for God? And then look at what he says in Ecclesiastes 2.11. Then I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought and on the labor that I had labored to do. And behold, he says, all is vanity. Look at this. Even building the temple, he said, was vanity. Isn't that incredible? And vexation of spirit. And there was no prophet under the sun. So you can see on the screen here, vanity is what he felt toward building the temple. Well, this is why his dad told him in Psalm 127, 1, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain who build it. This shows you he felt like he built the house, which is why he didn't get, give credit to the 200,000 people who did all the work. David had the plans. David gave him the plans by the spirit. David gave him everything. I don't think he lifted a finger to build it. Now, look at this. In Ecclesiastes 2, 15 through 20, Dan said, I am my heart 
as it happens to the fool, it happened even to me. So why was I any more wise? For there's no remembrance of the wise more than of the fool forever, seeing that which now is in the days to come shall all be forgotten. And how dies the wise man? Just like the fool. Therefore, Solomon says, I hated life. Oh my word. I hated life. Why does he hate life? Look at this. Because the work that is done under the sun is grievous to me for all his vanity and vexation of spirit. Yea, I hated all my labor, which I had taken under the sun. Why? Because I have to leave it to someone else. And who knows if they're going to be foolish or wise. I got to leave it to someone else. Will he be wise or a fool? Yet he's going to have rule over all of my labor, wherein I labored and wherein I have showed myself so wise under the sun. This is vanity. Therefore, I went about to cause my heart to despair of all the labor which I took under the sun. <laughs> I mean, think about what Solomon was really like. Now, look at Luke 12, 16 and 20. Yeshua was telling a parable, and he said there was a ground of a certain rich man. As soon as he says certain rich man, they're all going to think of Solomon, who brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have much goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But look what God said to him. You fool, this night your soul will be required of you. And then who shall those things be which you have provided? That's exactly what Solomon was whining about. Who's going to get all this stuff I provided? He's totally talking about Solomon here. Unless you make the connections, you don't realize that. As a matter of fact, what did he say uh, in Luke? Yeshua said that the certain rich man said, there's nothing better to do than to eat, drink, and be merry. Guess what? Look at Ecclesiastes 8.15. What did Solomon say? Then I commended mirth because a man has nothing better to do under the sun than to eat, drink, and be merry. Yeshua is directly furry referring to Solomon. And nobody catches this parable is about Solomon. Well, let's go back to Luke 12, where that parable is about Solomon. And it says in verse 27, consider the lilies, how they grow. They don't toil, they don't spin, and then I say to them, Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. It's telling you, he's talking about Solomon in the very next verse. How could we not miss that? Now, let's go on. Solomon said the best thing to do was to what? Eat, drink, and be merry. And what does Yeshua say? Don't seek what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink. Again, he's referring back to Solomon. Don't be of a doubtful mind, for all these things is what the nations of the world seek after. Your father knows you have need of these things. Rather, seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things will be added to you. Don't fear, little flock. It is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Wow. Do you see the connection between this and the Gospels? Referring right back to Solomon? As a matter of fact, Nehemiah, after the temple was destroyed, okay, this has been like six, seven hundred years since Solomon. Look what it says in Nehemiah. They're trying to come back and rebuild the destroyed temple of Solomon. And it says, in those days also saw I Jews that had married wives of Ashdod, of Ammon, and Moab, and their children spoke half in the speech of Ashdod and couldn't even speak Hebrew, but according to the language of each people. So I contended with them. I cursed them. I smote them. I plucked off their hair and made them swear by God, saying, you will not give your daughters to their sons, 
nor take their daughters for your sons or for yourselves. Did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? They all knew and blamed Solomon. Yet among many nations was there no king like him. He was beloved of his God, and God made him king over all of Israel. Nevertheless, even him did outlandish women cause to sin. Shall we then hearken to you to do all this great evil, to transgress against our God of marrying these strange wives? Now, are you ready for another shocker? Do you like shockers? Okay, here we go. If you remember... David's dying. Adonijah, from one of David's wives, claims himself as king, right? And so Bathsheba runs to David and said, didn't you say Solomon was supposed to be king? I mean, this is huge. And so let's look at 1 Kings 1, 34 and 35. Let Zadok, the priest, and Nathan, the prophet, anoint Solomon king over Israel, blow with the shofar, and say, God save the king, Solomon. Then you're to come up after him that he may come and sit upon what? David's throne. For he will be king in my stead, and I have appointed him to be ruler over Israel and over Judah. Now, this is interesting. Look at 1 Kings 8.20. This is at the dedication of the temple itself. It says, um, oh, no, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. This is, this is as David died. This is right after David dies. And Solomon says, as the Lord has performed his word that he spoke, and I am risen up in the room of David, my father, and I sit on the throne of what? Okay, we got the David's throne. We have the throne of Israel as the Lord had promised. And I built a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. Okay, so this is at the dedication ceremony. Okay, this is at the dedication ceremony. And then <clears throat> look at Jeremiah. We're going 500 years in advance. Jeremiah 22.2. It says, hear the word of the Lord, O King of Judah, that sits upon the throne of... Okay, we got the throne of David and the throne of Israel. Okay, now look at this. It says in 1 Chronicles 29, verse 22, and they made Solomon, the son of David, king, what? What? Second time. Okay, what has happened? 11 years have passed. They anointed Solomon king right when Adonijah was trying to become king. And then he didn't start to build the temple until the fourth year of his reign. Then it was seven years building it. So he was anointed right at that time. And then 11 years later at the dedication of the temple, they're anointing him a second time. Okay? It's like the first time wasn't good enough. Okay, so now he wants to be dedicated 11 years later, or when the temple is dedicated 11 years later, they want, he wants them to install him as king again. Okay, we have the throne of David. We have the throne of Israel. Okay, so it's the second time. And anointed him under the Lord to be chief governor and Zadok to be priest. Then Solomon sat on the throne of the Lord. What? Not the throne of David. Not the throne of Israel. Eleven years later, he wants to be reanointed and sit on the throne of the Lord as king instead of David his father, and prospered, and all Israel obeyed him. Now, if you remember in 1 Kings 4:31, it says Solomon was wiser than all men, wiser than Ethan the Ezraite, Heman, and Calcol, and Darda, the sons of Maho. And his fame was in all the nations round about, okay? Solomon had all the wisdom, all the power, all the fame, okay? All the money. He had all of everything. His fame was where? Throughout the world. So now let's go see 400 years later what the prophet Ezekiel says, or what the Lord says through the prophet Ezekiel. He says concerning Israel in Ezekiel 16, 13 through 19, he's referring to Israel and he says, you were decked with gold and silver. Your raiment was a fine linen, silk, richly woven work. 
You ate fine flour and honey and oil. You did wax exceedingly beautiful, as, uh, and you was meat for royal estate. And your renown went forth among the nations because of your beauty. Okay, this is talking about Solomon's reign. For it was perfect through my splendor, which I had put upon you, says the Lord God. But you did trust in your own beauty. You played the harlot because of your fame. And you poured out your holotries on everyone that passed by his that was, referring to the Queen of Sheba. And you did take off your garments and... You made for yourself high places and decked with diverse colors and you played the harlot on them. The like things shall not come, neither shall it be. So you took your fair jewels of my gold, my silver, which I'd given you, and you made for yourself images of men and you played the harlot with them and you took your richly woven garments and covered them and you set my oil and my incense before them, my bread also, which I gave you, fine flour and oil and honey worth, I fed you. You did even set it before them for a sweet savor, and thus it was, says the Lord. Wow! God gives her everything, and then she goes and gives it to whom she loves. That was Solomon. Now, look at this. What else does Solomon do? In Ezekiel 16, 20, 21, it goes on to say, Moreover, you've taken your sons and your daughters whom you have borne unto me, and you sacrificed unto them to be devoured. And that's what Solomon did. He gave his firstborn to Molech. And that's what all of Israel did for the next 400 years. He says, were your hollow trees a small matter that you have slain my children and delivered them up and setting them apart unto them? Now, does this kind of give you an idea how Solomon's maybe not who you thought he was? It gets worse. If you really want to know what he was like, see what his mother thought of him. All right, are you ready? How many of you have heard of Proverbs 31? Here it is, and I'm going to give you two different versions. The words of King Lemuel. That's a nickname for Solomon. The prophecy that his mother taught him. This shows you how wrong the King James is. Okay, let me give you a better translation. The words of King Lemuel, the burden wherewith his mother chastised him completely different. When you hear the prophecy that his mother taught him, it's like, gee, he's spirit-filled, he's prophetic, and his mommy's teaching him something. Not. It's not the word prophecy at all. It's a mistranslation. It's a burden that his mother whipped up on him. And what is she saying? Well, let's look at Proverbs 31, 2 and 3. What? My son? And what the son of my womb and what the son of my vows, don't give your strength to women nor your ways to that which destroys kings. Now, why was she saying that? It's a good thing, but it's also a bad thing. You know what Lemuel means? You are a God for them. So she treated Solomon as a God for the others. And since he considered himself a god, he thought he was above the laws for kings. Okay. And so she's telling him, don't, if you're a god, don't act like that. And so now, look at Proverbs 31, 4 and 5. It is not for kings, O God, for them. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. I mean, this is... Uh, it's, it's really a strange situation here. Okay, but then she talks about the virtuous woman, right? That's a wrong translation too. It's a completely wrong translation. So we're going to look at something here, but I have to start at the beginning. Genesis is where I'm going to start. It says, the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed Into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. 
And the word for life is chai. See? Chai. Uh, you see people with that uh, necklace with those Hebrew letters on it, chai, and it means life. And then I want to show you another word, though. If you take that and you add the letter lamed, it's kayil. And what does kayil mean? Kayil means a force to be reckoned with. The lamed represents authority. It's one thing to have life and be in India on the streets as a peasant. It's another thing to have life and have it to the full and with authority and power. So chayil is a very important word. It means a force to be reckoned with. And then it says in Genesis 2.8, and the, oh, let me show you this. Chayil basically is also translated as valor. Chayil. Okay? Everybody say Kayil. Not Kayil, it's Kayil. Come on, put the force in it. Kayil. Yeah, it's a force to be reckoned with. Okay, now it says the Lord God planted a garden. You know what? The garden was not part of creation. The Garden of Eden wasn't part of creation. After all of creation, in Genesis 2, it says the Lord God planted the garden. Why? Because he was going to create man out of the garden. And so he, he planted it especially for man. Okay, but look what happens. It says in Genesis 2, 8, the Lord God planted a garden in, uh, eastward in Eden, and there he put the man whom he had formed. Adam was not created from the dirt of the Garden of Eden. Adam was created from the dirt outside of the Garden of Eden, and then he puts them in the Garden of Eden after he had planted it. Okay, uh, uh, we just saw that in Genesis 2, 8. Okay, and look at Genesis 2, 15. And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the word for keep there means to hedge about with thorns, to guard, to protect. So here's the Garden of Eden, and Adam was to guard it and protect it like a watchman. Okay, and then now, Genesis 2, 16 through 18, here we see the Lord God commanding the man. Notice the man, why Eve wasn't created when the command was given not to eat of the tree. And he says to Adam, of every tree of the garden, you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. From the day you eat thereof, you shall surely die. And the Lord God said, hmm, it's not good that man should be alone. I will make a help meet for him. Now, here's the thing. A lot of people don't understand that word help meet. In Hebrew, the help meet, the word is atzer. And what it means, he needs someone to surround him, to protect him, to be an ally. Wow. Now that's different. Let me show you an etzer. I need an etzer. Help me. These are etzers. They're protecting the big guy. Okay. So there's man and women are to be the ones who surround him and protect him. I think it's interesting in the October 7th war, it was the women who saw the enemy coming, reported it, and the men didn't listen. The women are given the big nose. They can smell. They have the intuition. And <clears throat> so here, I, I think this is amazing. For example, this is why in a Jewish wedding, the bride walks around the man seven times, surrounding him, protecting him from all others. We find this in Jeremiah 31, 22. Here's one translation. For Jehovah has created a new thing in the earth. A woman shall encompass or surround a man. Here's it in another version. For the Lord has created a new thing on the earth. A woman protects a man. She was created to be his bodyguard. Why? Because she would see the enemy coming, tap him on the shoulder and say, oh, honey, here comes the enemy. And then he would go get him. For example, in Genesis 
15, verse 2, Abram says, Lord God, what will you give me seeing I go childless? And the steward of my house is this Eli Etzer of Damascus. Eli Etzer, that's that word. He was the watchman for God. El Etzer, God's watchman. Okay, now look at Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 17 and 18. Here they're trying to build the walls again of the temple after they've come back from the Babylonian captivity. And it says, those who were building the wall and those who were moving material did their part. Everyone working with one hand, his spear in the other, every builder was working with his sword at his side and by my side was a man sounding the horn. Okay, so they're watching, they're at Sayers while they're working. All right, now here's something I want everyone to think about. Going back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 19 and 20. Here it says, God's trying to find a protector for man, an Elie, uh, an Etzer. And it says, out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air, and brought them to Adam to see what he would call them. And whatever Adam called every living creature, that was the name. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to all the fowls of the air and to every beast of the field. Okay, so here's God bringing to Adam lions and tigers and bears, oh my, and dinosaurs. And none of these were good enough to protect Adam. What man wouldn't want a T-Rex to ride around on with the saddle? Yeah, come on, get me. Okay. But none of those were a help meet. In other words, none of those could protect him. Why? Because of the nature of the enemy. It's Satan is the enemy. What good is a dinosaur, lion, or tiger, bear going to do against a taunt? Nothing. So, um, look at this. Look at Joshua 1, 14. I'm going to put this picture up. Boom. Again. Here in Joshua, you shall pass before your brethren armed all the mighty men of valor and help them. You know what that says? What's the Hebrew word for valor? Kayil. Kayil. And to help them, what's the word? Etzer. Okay. So valor is kayil, and the purpose is to help, be a helpmeet. All right, now, what kayil means again, it means a force to be reckoned with, to have the means, all the resources, an army, wealth, virtue, valor, strength, to possess all that is needed to carry out the task. That's what kayil means. Psalms 108.13, it says, Through God we shall do valiantly, for he it is that will tread down our enemies. Guess what the Hebrew word for valiantly is? No, not kayil, it's kayil. Oh, okay. Now, look at Psalm 59.11. Scatter them by your power. And what's the Hebrew word for power? Yeah. All right. Isaiah 60, verse 5. Because the abundance of the sea will be converted to you because the forces of the Gentile will come to you. And the Hebrew word means forces. Second Chronicles 17, 12 and 13. And Jehoshaphat waxed great exceedingly and he built in Judah castles and cities of store and he had much business in the cities of Judah and the men of war, the mighty men of valor, which means you. Okay, so let's look at this. Kayul means Powerful, a force, valiant, valor. And in Proverbs 31, 10, 11, it's not virtuous. It's who can find a Kayil woman. It's not virtuous. Who can find a woman that is a powerful force? Isn't that amazing? And look what it goes on to say. Her price is far above rubies, and the heart of her husband safely trusts in her so that he will have no need of spoil, because she's like a conquering army on her own. (laughs) 
Now, there are two reasons why men would not want women to be mighty and powerful. Number one, they don't see women as their allies, but their enemy. Or number two, they don't think they even need an ally. They don't see the size of the battle before them or realize the nature of the battle. Now, what does that word et ser actually mean? Here's the word. It's the ayin, the zayin, and the resh. The ayin is I. The zayin is a weapon. And like rosh, the resh is head. Now, in the ancient Hebrew that Moses would have written in, it have looking, uh, looked like this. The eye, the weapon, and you see the head. So what does the word at ser actually mean is she is the one who sees the enemy coming. The very word at ser, help me, means she is the one who sees the weapon man coming. Is that fascinating or what? Yes. You know, and so this is why it's so important that husband and wives work as a team and not independent of each other. So with that, let's stand. So uh, I believe we're done with Solomon and now we'll be going into the Song of Songs. But now I want you to understand why Solomon is not a type of the Messiah in this book. Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, we just thank you so much that you love us so much and you want all of us to be powerful. You want all of us to work together, even as you said in your word, two is better than one because when one falls, the other one can pick them up. Father, let none of us think it's all about me or all about the individual. Father, we have to have a bigger picture. We've got to see it's all of us together, working together. And we're all your kids. And we need to love one another as kids and lift one another up instead of tearing each other down. And Father, we just thank you that you not only want to bless us, you want to put your name upon us, even as you said in your word. Ivareka Adonai Vishmareka, Yaer Adonai Panavileka Vihuneka. Esau Adonai Panavileka Vyasemblaka Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace in that most wonderful name. Ayah, Asher, Ayah. Amen. Go get him. Most